Hi, friends and fellow dog lovers. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to Don't Stop Retrieving, Training Hunting Dogs. This is the third of 14 live sessions on YouTube and Facebook that are part of the Digital Wyoming Outdoor Expo. Tonight, we're all about the dogs. We've got a video of Rook and Arlo demonstrating flushing and pointing. Then we'll discuss some different breeds and their purposes, go over some important things to keep in mind when training a bird dog, and talk about how to find places for bird hunting in Wyoming. And we're here to answer your questions. I'm here in Cheyenne at the Game and Fish headquarters. Mark, Teal, Rook, and Louie are in the Laramie Regional Office, and we'd like to know where you're watching from. So please, in the chat, introduce yourself, let us know what kind of dog or dogs that you have, and get comfy. Without further ado, let's get going. My name is Teal Kafad. I'm the Saratoga Wildlife Biologist, and I'm going to be demonstrating a flushing dog uh, with Rook. He's my three-year-old field-bred English Cocker Spaniel. And I'm Mark Kafad, the Habitat and Access Biologist here in Saratoga. I'll be demonstrating a pointing dog with a two-year-old Spinoni named Arlo. So we have a placed bird out in the field, and I'm going to be showing you how he works in the field. Teal's going to head out here with Rook. Uh, Rook's a flusher, so he's going to try to, you know, work about 20 yards from her. Hopefully a little closer, but no more than 20 yards. He'll run back and forth, kind of, and you'll kind of notice as he catches the scent cone of the bird. Um, he'll likely get a little faster. His tail will get more erratic. That's how she knows that he's on the bird and has the scent of it. And then uh, his job is to present the bird to you, so he'll pop that bird up out of the cover to present it for a shot. So we have the bird uh, string tied around the bird's leg to a wooden dowel to kind of weight it down so we can reuse him for training purposes here. So Mark's going to be running Arlo. Arlo's a two-year-old Spinoni Italiano, so he's a, a pointer. So it'll be much different than, than Rook in how he behaves in the field. So he's going to loop him in a way that that wind is coming right to his nose. Kind of got this northerly wind today, so should be a good way to approach the field for him. Give him the biggest advantage to, to scent those birds. So with a pointer, they're typically a little bigger running dog, which means that they're allowed to get out a little bit further in front of their handler. So you can see he's quite a bit further out than Rook would be. The reason being is when he scents a bird, he's actually going to cease momentum, so he's going to stop in the field. And his nose should be pointing to the direction of that bird. So we do allow them to get out a little bit further. Spinoni Italianos are kind of a fun pointer and, and that's why Mark and I were certainly attracted to them because they are a slower working pointer than um, like a German wire-haired pointer is or an English pointer. They typically do work a little bit closer than those pointing dogs, but still allowed to range out a little bit further. We expect our dogs to cast quite a bit. You can see he's looking back to Mark for some direction. Um, being that he is a younger dog, he, he does check in with us a little bit more to, to kind of gain that confidence in the field. Spinonis are also really well known for their tracking capabilities, which is also a component of having a versatile pointing breed. And so you'll notice that he spends a lot more time on a track than um, say some of these other pointing, bigger running dogs would. Once he scents a bird, he's gonna cease momentum. So that might be the location of the bird. Mark did have to place a bird twice, so that could be an old location too. Unlike a flusher, he is supposed to stop, and Mark is supposed to flush the bird. But just like a flusher with these versatile pointing breeds, we do expect them to retrieve that bird once it's down. So retrieve just means that he's gonna pick up that bird, whether it be wounded and he catches it, or whether it is dead on the ground, if, if it is shot bird, he's expected to bring it back to his handler. So he's supposed to bring it back to Mark. This bird's got quite a bit of life, obviously, because it wasn't shot, so he's feeling a little frisky with that bird in his mouth, but brings it back to Handler. His job's done. We hope you enjoyed the day's bird dog demo, and see you.
seeing the different types of bird dogs between flushers and pointers and hopefully you can get out this fall with your dog and chase some of the birds that are available in Wyoming. Welcome back, and I see we've got folks from Wisconsin uh, and Las Vegas uh, and West Virginia. So uh, thanks for joining us, and then Manville, Wyoming. So there's a variety of uh, towns and states represented, and we're glad you're here. Uh, let's get going on uh, some things about breeds. So I know that Arlo's a, a Spinoni, and Rook is an English Cocker Spaniel. Um, past. Uh, what should folks keep in mind when they are choosing a breed? Uh, so when you're picking a bird dog breed, it should be more of kind of the temperament and behavior of the dog that you like that fits your lifestyle. So size, activity level, um, those are the two main things that I would focus on. And then after that, look towards um, the looks. That's always an important one for people too. Yeah, I think Mark touched on it a little bit, but certainly um, deciding what kind of game you're going to be pursuing with, with your hunting dog. Um, if it's a bird hunting dog, obviously what kind of bird species do you hope to be pursuing? Um, if you're a person that's particularly interested in uh, waterfall hunting, you might look more towards um, a retriever or potentially a, a flushing breed like Rook is, a spaniel. Or if you're more interested in like sage grouse hunting or rough grouse hunting, you might look to one of these pointing breeds. Uh, many of these hunting dog breeds are very versatile, so they can be used in a number of ways. Uh, but there certainly are kind of specialties depending on the breed of dog. So Definitely identifying what kind of game you want to pursue in pursuing a breed um, that's that's more specialized for that particular game that you're you're after. And I think an, another thing is is that you know hunting seasons are only about three to four months of the year. Uh, so, so getting a breed that's good in the house or a breed that you can live with for, for the rest of the year is is also really important. So for me, I like to travel with my dogs quite a bit. So size is important. Uh, Rook, my spaniel, is is kind of the ultimate size or the perfect size for me because he's a smaller dog, so he's easy to throw in the truck and ride around with on a daily basis. Um, some of these larger breeds, you might have to uh, put in a kennel or in the back of the truck, um, which that can work for you, but it just kind of depends on what you can live with uh, during the off season as well. And I know you mentioned uh, pointers and uh, flushers, and I've also heard people talk about setters. Can you explain the difference between uh, those three and maybe give us some examples of the different breeds? So flushing dogs are like your spaniels, labradors, um, that's kind of the ba the basis of the flushing dogs, those two, and then there's all sorts of different breeds. So Labradors, Springer Spaniels, Clumber Spaniels, uh, the Cocker Spaniels, Boykin Chessies. Spaniels, yeah, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. So their job is to go out, um, work work relatively close to the handler, and present the bird, uh, flush them up to for the shot. Uh, pointers and setters are, are their job is essentially the same. They're supposed to find the bird in the field and cease momentum and allow the hunter to come in and flush the bird for a shot. Um, the, the major difference between pointers and setters too. Yeah, uh, generally pointers and setters are, are doing pretty much the same thing. Um, setters are typically a little bit more cautious when they're working the field. Um, I, I grew up with English setters and, and we hunted rough grouse um, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, quite often with our setters. So a little bit closer working dog, it seems like, than some of the bigger running pointers um, that we've seen since we've moved west. Um, and also just kind of a little bit more cautious with birds, uh, but pretty similar in how they act between setters and pointers. Uh, so generally you break the, the gun dogs down into um, three groups, those flushing spaniels, retrievers, and in pointers. All right. So if now that I've, let's say I've decided what kind of dog I want, um, what are some things that I should keep in mind when working with my dogs or things that I should teach my dog? Uh, the basic obedience is the biggest one. Um, can I start with that and everything else builds off of that. Um, we use clicker training as part of that. Um, it's very food motivated training, but it, we were introduced to it with Rook and it made the training a lot easier for us. And we used it with Arlo as well. And all the basic obedience around the house 
and in the field as far as your recall um, being in a place where they just stay, that's their spot and everything it worked really well for us. Yeah, you'll notice when you get into the, the bird dog world, um, there's a ton of different philosophies on how to train your dog and it can be somewhat overwhelming. Uh, so for, for Mark and I, the biggest thing was getting those, those foundations um, and, and we used definitely clicker training to build that foundation uh, to build off of for the rest of these, these skills that these bird dogs would use in the field. Uh, the cool thing about bird dogs is they've got a, a natural instinct, uh, a natural drive, a prey drive. So they're going to make you look good in the field, but the biggest thing is, is that they are going to have that basic obedience. So we really focus a lot of the early weeks and months on that basic obedience. You'll hear us say that over and over again. And clicker training is, is one way that we certainly kind of honed in on those, those particular skills. And I'd say there's several commands that are really important. Um, sit, heal, place for us. Some people say pad or kennel, um, but making sure that the animal can go to its place and it knows um, when to go there and how to stay there. Uh, any others that I'm missing? Sit, heal, place, come that recall to come to you or hear, um, that's pretty important. Um, and kind of touching on that, you'll, you'll notice that I've got a couple different commands that I reference. So whether it be uh, come or hear, those are all recall commands. Uh, there's a lot to be said about consistency and how you're commanding your dog um, to listen to you. So between Mark and I, we found when we were training dogs, it was sometimes tough because he would say hear and I would call come. So getting that consistency within a household and who's going to be handling the dogs is also super important. But basic obedience is, is a huge one. And then, like I said, they've got that natural instinct. So they're going to make you look good in the field uh, if they've got those those foundations. Uh, you've got some dogs there. Would you like to demonstrate any of this? So I think what Mark will do is he will try uh, to show you how to mark a good behavior. And I think he'll start probably with just showing you how to use a clicker. Um, clickers are super cheap. You can buy a whole pack of them on Amazon for, I don't know, five bucks. And that's how we, we started with the clicker training. And you can use clicker training to teach your dog place, sit, uh, a handshake, rollover, any of those commands. Um, but marking this good behavior or what behavior you want to see from your dog is, is the first step to clicker training. So this is just a taste for, for what um, we've been doing with our dogs to kind of build that basic obedience and that foundation for a good bird dog. So we start with, we just start with loading the dog so you can give him a treat and then he associates the clicker sound with the treat. And then so Rook, Rook's older, so he knows, and he goes off looking for treats because that's <laughs> Rook. Rook. Here. Place. Place. Rook. So he's just marking that once he hits that place. And with a brand new dog that's new to clicker training, once you load them up, which loading again just means Rook. you're feeding them treats and clicking. You just want to mark that good behavior. So whether it's coming to place. you with the here command place. or going to his place, you want to show him what that, place. that that's the mark that you want by clicking and treating him. Here. For us, this is a pretty natural transition. We went from clicker training to using an e-collar, an electronic collar to provide kind of stimuli so they knew when the mark was good or when they were executing a good behavior. Place. So he's kind of getting the hang of it. And you can do anything, like I said, with clicker train, just about anything. Um, down is, is a command you can do, uh, like Mark has been calling here or come. You can get them to recall with the clicker. With a retrieving dog, you can also get them um, to kind of hone in on their retrieving skills by clicking them when they do bring back a bumper or a, a pigeon, whatever, whatever you might be throwing to them. So that was just a quick run through. Um, this is a huge thing to run through in the off season. Um, so like I said, bird season, they're only like three to four months. So you have a lot of time during the off season to work on some of these skills. And you can see Rook is pretty rusty. So we might need to, to work on some of his clicker skills and some of this basic obedience um, during the next couple months. All right, neat. Well, folks, if you're just joining us, we're here for Don't Stop Retrieving with Mark Kufad and Teal Kufad and Rook and Arlo and Louie. Um, they are uh, some hunting dogs uh, and looks like 
Rook has got place figured out. Um, so uh, I know there's some other things that we wanted to talk about in terms of things to be doing with your dogs uh, to make sure that they're going to be the dog that you want to be hunting with in the field. Um, are there, I want to go back to you, Mark and Teal, for that. But then also, folks, if you have any questions, if you're uh, embarking on some dog training and uh, would like uh, some advice, please uh, pop those in the chat. So, uh, Mark and Teal, is there are there other things that you wanted to talk about? Um, lot, lots of bird contacts make bird dogs. So you got to have birds to make bird dogs. So whether that's going in the off season, going to bird farms, um, pigeons quail, um, and then just using even the wild populations that are around um, to train with or during hunting season. You got to, if you're going to have bird dogs, you got to be willing to take them to birds if you don't have birds locally. Yeah, lots of exposure, whether it be to okay. birds is, is super important Thanks. or just to kind of terrain and conditions Same. that you plan to be hunting in. So exposure to birds is certainly important, but especially with a new pup, getting them exposed to a bunch of different country and places that you anticipate hunting. So like for us, we like to hunt dusky grouse or blue grouse and where we hunt those grouse, there's a lot of downfall timber. So even with a new pup, that can be pretty intimidating. And to build that confidence, just spending time in that kind of terrain during the off season is pretty huge. Uh, for dogs that you might expect to retrieve in the water, uh, a lot of time in the water. In Wyoming, we have very short seasons for when the water is actually warm and kind of a good time to get your dog out and used to water work um, yeah. is, is certainly June through July. So if you can get them out in the water, used to the water, Same. liking the water uh, during the off season, that is super important. Um, and then additionally, I think uh, looking into maybe some of the hunt clubs in your area, uh, Mark has been kind of taking on the NA or the natural ability testing through the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. Um, a lot of their trials or their tests are in the summer months. So that might be something to look into. It can certainly connect you with a lot of other bird dog and um, hunting dog owners. So pretty neat uh, to take on that during the off season as well to get your dog brushed up and ready to go um, for the fall. Sure. It looks like we've got some uh, new dog owners watching. Uh, Ross is picking up a wire-haired pointing Griffon uh, next weekend. Looks like uh, that dog's going to be a family dog as well as a hunting dog um, with a puppy. Uh, what all? I know that there's different training methods out there. I know uh, I've bought, I purchased several books, uh, and so. Do you wanna, can you give us some uh, tips on how to uh, decide on a, on, a, on a trainer model or uh, finding a good mentor? So as far as like trying to find a model to go after, um, there's lots of books, um, lots of DVDs. We, we used, initially we started with the George Hickox DVDs and methods and that's, that's kind of where we picked up the clicker training. Um, YouTube's a great source for a lot of training. There is a lot of it out there. One of the better ones we've found is Standing Stone Kennels. They're very consistent and the quality of product that they put out is really good. Yeah, like I had mentioned, it's, it can be almost kind of overwhelming because there's um, so many books out there, so many videos out there, so many YouTube channels now dedicated to dog training. And what will ultimately happen is, is that you probably patch um, pieces of advice that you hear from a bunch of different resources together to make the gun dog that you want. Um, I, it's, it's tough because sometimes you get into this um, comparison, you're comparing your gun dog to these other gun dogs that you might be seeing on YouTube and things like that. And maybe your dog's not to that certain level. Um, but really grab from the resources, things that you like and things that your dog are, are doing well and taking to and kind of make it your own. And that was one thing with, with me, with uh, Rook. I really like the clicker training. I got to the point with um, like e-collar training where I was a little uncomfortable going kind of the methods that I saw on YouTube. So I kind of made my, my own method and you'll kind of learn as you go what works for your dog and for you. So um, lots of resources out there, but don't get too caught up if your dog's not kind of responding like the dogs on the YouTube channels are. Um, you'll make your own kind of training platform from there. And then as far as mentors, um, the clubs that Teal had kind of mentioned, uh, Nav does a great one. As far as locally, there's a chapter in Cheyenne uh, called the Frontier Chapter, and there's a chapter in it's called the Black Hills chapter, uh, based out of south of Sundance, in the Carrick Creek area. And then as far as the western side of the state, there's one in 
eastern Idaho and one in Salt Lake. So those are great opportunities, at least for the pointing dogs to have mentors from. Um, flushing dogs, there's retriever clubs, spaniel clubs, AKC Master Hunter program, um, getting into those kind of things. Um, trying to find people that do those things, coworkers, neighbors. I mean, a lot of people are into dogs. You can kind of find people if you're willing to communicate and talk with them. Yeah, even some of the groups like Pheasants Forever, um, Quail Forever, Ducks Unlimited, uh, a lot of those people that are part of those um, those memberships, they're oftentimes gun dog folks. Uh, so if you guys are attending banquets and things like that, you'll be amazed at how many uh, connections you can make because people are really passionate about your dogs, their, their dogs. Um, yeah, I can't hardly stop talking about my dog when I'm in public. So um, sometimes we can be too much. But yeah, you'll, you'll probably find a lot of resources at some of these banquets and things like that through uh, nonprofits. Great. Thanks. Um, looks like Kenny in Manville uh, has a question. He struggles with his lab getting too far out. Uh, how can I keep him closer for hunting pheasants? Um, I would, I'd start in the off season. It's the best place to do it. Um, as far as a physical means, a check cord is a great tool for that. Uh, check cord is basically a length of rope uh, for, for Kenny in a lab. I would start I'd start as short as possible and keeping the dog close. Um, I think like 10, 10 yards, roughly start with that. And then once the dog's kind of picking up on that, um, moving towards an e-collar and when the dog gets to a certain point, as far as you, what your comfortable distance is, is using that e-collar to let the dog know he shouldn't go any farther. Um, that can be as simple as just a, using the vibrate or tone feature, not really any, electronic stimulant on the dog a lot of that's enough for most dogs um, other dogs you kind of the e-collars have different settings on them so you can set the amount of shock that that dog's going to get and it's never never enough that's going to hurt the dog it's just enough that they feel it um, the level you'd kind of want kind of depends on the dog but enough that the, you can see the dog kind of just turn their neck into that that electronic stimuli is enough for most dogs to kind of know that it's time to come back and tighten up and just being consistent on that stuff, not letting them get out to that distance that you're not comfortable with keeping that boundary set. Yeah. And with Rook, because um, he is a flushing dog, probably like what you're trying to do with your, your Labrador. Um, we did a lot of quartering work. So trying to get him out in front of us, but not too far by actually incorporating some pigeons and we'd spread out in a field and I would have a pigeon, Mark would have a pigeon and we'd encourage him to go across the field at only a certain distance that was acceptable to us and really showing your dog that um, you are in control of the birds and you'll ultimately have the birds in the field. Um, that's a good thing to kind of keep them close. So encouraging that quartering by keeping control of a pigeon or a bird or something that interests them like a bumper that's uh that's definitely key all right um now we've got uh we're getting some uh good advice in the comments so thank you tom and ross uh and yes yeah, so yep um and then so now that we've theoretically got our gun dog trained uh and we're in wyoming how can we uh, find places that we could hunt some birds in Wyoming? Uh, so uh, as far as our resources that we have, um, we used our website and we go to the public access tab and we, you can use a multi multitude of them, but we can start with hunter management areas. Um, so we can go to our hunter management area tab and choose a hunter management area when it loads up here. I think a, a big first step too, before you even dive into some of this public access um, parts of our website and where you can actually go to hunt is kind of figuring out where these birds are within Wyoming. Um, so we don't have a ton of like great distribution maps, uh, but you can set, certainly check out like the Cornell lab has some great uh, bird distribution maps that you can kind of check out just to generally see in Wyoming uh, where some of these game birds are going to be occupying or where they're going to be living. And then from there kind of identifying some of these general areas that you want to be in. Um, for like sage grouse, you're going to want to be focusing on these uh, like sagebrush step areas since they're sagebrush obligates. Um, it's going to be really important that you find these sagebrush ecosystems to, to hunt sage, sage grouse. If you're hunting more for like a chucker, where would you say folks should head for like chucker partridge? Uh, in Wyoming, probably more towards the Bighorn Basin, uh, steep rocky country with 
a lot of grass species for them to feed on. Yeah, so a, a, a huge thing is if you don't know where these these birds are going to be, you can certainly call your local game and fish um, biologist or game warden. And we typically have a pretty good idea, I think, of, of where these game birds are going to be uh, hanging out. So you can certainly give us a call. Uh, we're a resource to you guys as you're planning your upland game hunts, just like we are for your big game hunts. So contact us. We'll kind of give you some, some pointers as to where to go locally or across the state. And then you can kind of jump into these public access areas mm -hmm. and opportunities across the state. Um, as far as public lands and private lands that are enrolled in their access yes programs. The other big one is studying the habitat types that they're in. Um, when Wyoming's full of sagebrush, but sage grouse, for example, during the hunting season key in on certain types of sagebrush. Like I focus on stuff that's not much taller than my boots and then relatively close to water or green grass. So once you kind of have an idea of those habitats that birds are going to be in, um, like Mark said, we've got a public access tab on our Game and Fish website, which I hope you guys can see here. Um, I can kind of zoom in so you, you can see what these spots look like. But you'll see on the left-hand side, there's actually an upland bird hunting tab, and you can hit that, and it actually shows you the hunter management areas that are open for bird hunting. Because these are mostly private lands that are enrolled in our Access Yes program, different ranches have different ranch rules and are open for different species. So this tab is super handy because you can actually go directly to those uh, HMAs that do um, allow bird hunting. So I'll pick one here, Coyote Creek. I don't even know where Coyote Creek is, but we'll check it out and see what it's uh, open for. So with our hunter management areas, if you scroll down, you can actually see which areas um, it's open for hunting. So you've got sage grouse that you can hunt here. If you guys are uh, also small game hunters, you can hunt rabbits on this particular uh, HMA. So really good resource there to kind of check out what species you're able to hunt. And it's a pretty good indicator that if it's open for hunting a particular species, that species is probably out there. So um, you can kind of further hone in uh, where species might be hanging out based on where uh, you can hunt on hunter management areas as well. Um, in addition to hunter management areas, we have walk-in areas. So if you go back to that public access tab, we've got these walk-in hunting areas. Similar interactive map here where you can zoom in and check out these walk-in areas. Again, just like hunter management areas, walk-in areas have different rules because, again, they're they're mostly private lands that are enrolled in these programs. So there might be different rules um, for these particular areas. So you just need to click on there. I'll go up to one in the Bighorn Basin because I bet those are going to have some, some game, game bird opportunity. What do you think? Do you think? That's a good chance. We'll click on this one here and see what it's open for. So this bighorn walk in hunting area 64 is open for waterfowl, so ducks and geese, pheasant, sage grouse, doves, partridge, um, and also some turkey hunting, rabbit hunting, and then if you guys are big game hunting, that's open for that as well. Um, so you can really kind of check where these, these opportunities exist. There are quite a few in the bighorn basin, like Mark said, for game birds. There's quite a bit of overlap um, among species and upland game species in the Bighorn Basin. I would say kind of this northeastern corner, you're going to run into some uh, sharp-tailed grouse opportunity, sage grouse opportunity. Um, what else am I missing? Hungarian partridge will be up there as well. In the flats. And then as you go up into the mountains, you'd run into the dusky grouse in that area. Yeah, so a lot of our walk-in areas, um, hunter management areas, they're probably not going to have a ton of like dusky grouse or rough grouse opportunity, mostly because those birds are going to be um, typically higher elevation. Um, not always. We certainly run into dusky grouse, at least in the snowies and Sierra Madres, kind of at that fringe between um, aspen and conifer forest. So down in like Carbon County, um, you will have some sage grouse opportunity down here, but rough grouse, dusky grouse, those are usually going to be kind of your public land hunts anyways up on the National Forest. So that's kind of a run through of our public access page on our Game and Fish website, a super neat tool for planning your game bird hunt. Um, and again, uh, our biologists and game wardens within the department are certainly a resource to you as you're, you're planning your upland hunt. 
Yep, and uh, I should uh, repeat that uh, Teal is one of those biologists in the Saratoga area. And in the comments, we have contact information for our field personnel uh, that can help you. Uh, they are a wealth of information and friendly and eager to help you enjoy Wyoming's wildlife. So um, we are that are people have been wanting to pop in the chat, please do. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, I think, I don't see any coming in. So uh, I think we'll wrap it up. So thank you for spending some of your evening with us. Uh, once we do end this, you'll be able to drop uh, a photo of your dog or dogs into the comments. So please do that. Uh, while you're waiting for that photo feature to be available, there is an evaluation link uh, in the uh, in the chat, uh, and we would appreciate your feedback. We have 11 more of these and want them to be useful to you. Um, and finally, uh, wyomingexpo.com has more information about uh, our programs uh, that are part of Expo Live. And if you register for uh, Expo Live events, uh, we can send you a text to remind you when it is happening. Uh, and then also you can get this really cool sticker. It's got a uh, uh, cutthroat trout with some pronghorn on it, and we will send you uh, send you one of those and enough for your family members as well. So you can uh, register for Expo Live events there, um, and then also fill out the evaluation form. So I think that's it. Mark and Teal, thank you for being here and sharing uh, Rook and Arlo and Louie with us. Um, it is uh, an honor to call you colleague and friend and uh, we appreciate your time. Everybody else, thanks for tuning in. Um, Y'all take care and uh, enjoy those dogs and don't stop retrieving.